Hi, I am Dee Dawkins Hagler, a candidate for Georgia's Secretary of State, and I am here with the Atlanta Voice. And just understand that a voice that is not heard cannot be effective. And so we're thanking the Atlanta Voice for allowing me this opportunity. So I am Dee Dawkins Hagler. I am uh, a resident of Lithonia, Georgia. Been living there about 24 years. I am married to an active duty colonel in the Army, uh, David Hagler Jr. We have four children, ranging in ages from 21 to 30. I have two grandchildren, Amari and Kingston. And my husband and I met on the college campus of South Carolina State University uh, our sophomore year. We've been together ever since. Uh, we went to grad school together as well. We both have our master's degrees from Kentucky State University. And then I came to Atlanta to work on my PhD in political science at Clark Atlanta University. And by the way, I stopped by ITC, uh, the Interdenominational Theological Seminary, and earned a Master of Divinity. And so I've been an AME preacher now in ministry for 25 years. Background is in human resource management and um, I just like to serve. Served nine years in the Georgia General Assembly. During that time, I chaired the Women's Caucus and I also chaired the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus, which is the largest black caucus in the nation, in addition to always serving in leadership positions throughout my career upon getting to the General Assembly within a few weeks of being there. They appointed me to be the assistant uh, deputy House Whip, one of the assistant deputy whips. So that shows what type of leadership skills I've had in my life. Mm -hmm. So you've covered everything. I don't have to ask a single thing after this. <laughs> so thank you for your background. But that just kind of speaks to how proud you are of the work that you've done and who you are as a person. And in general, can you just say about your time as being a state rep, you know, what you saw during that time and what you feel Georgia needs in a secretary of state now? That's a very good question. So Georgia is very unique in that we have a very large contingency of a minority population. Georgia right now is about 49% minority with 33% of that being African Americans. And with that, that is about 3 million black people with $64 billion worth of buying power per year. So what we see in Georgia is that many times black people were not getting the number of federal or state contracts that were needed. Black people were not uh, getting the resources they needed for uh, health care or education and so one of the things that I got to witness firsthand being the chair of the Black Caucus and working with all of the 159 counties within the state of Georgia is the need to close many of the disparities that we have whether they are economic disparities or whether they're health disparities education disparities and making sure that the legislation that's put forth will be able to lift our people that's very important because representation matters. So one of the things that I saw uh, unfolding then and now is the continual uh, separation almost of races. We don't want to say that because it sounds kind of odd in 2022, but when you look at the effects of white supremacy and what white privilege looks like and how it shows up even in public policy, even in 2022, you have to be alarmed, especially when you look at things like voter suppression bills. Uh, you, you say, well, how could this happen in 2022? Or how can we have a state that will not accept Medicaid expansion or, or a state that will not put more emphasis on helping uh, young black people start businesses or how to invest in the start market? And all of those things actually fall up in the Secretary of State's office is why I'm mentioning them. Um, whether it is uh, voting rights, uh, voting elections, whether it is incorporating businesses, whether it is receiving your professional licensing, or whether it's, it's protecting your uh, securities and exchanges with the stock market, all of that falls up under the office of the Secretary of State. Now, based on what you've seen from previous Secretaries of States, right, mm -hmm. and the parties that they are affiliated with, mm -hmm. how do you feel a, a change is really needed in that seat specifically? So a change is definitely needed. If we go back to 2008, when I first went to the General Assembly, I started seeing the erosion of uh, voting rights even then. So by the time 2010 came around, uh, many people may not be familiar with this case called Quitman 10, plus two, it's equipment 10 plus two now. So it happened in Quitman, Georgia, and basically it was a suppression of black votes, but black women got out, got people registered to vote, 
educated them, did advanced voting, and they were able to flip some Republican seats. Now, what happened is, at that time, uh, Brian Kemp was the Secretary of State, and he allowed the Republicans to file charges against these black women for registering people to vote. Mm -hmm. And as a result, these black women received felony charges. Right. And this went on for years and years and years. So the black caucus, we had to really help to do that and un unravel that, even just giving them support. But this day, you know, it was litigated for years mm -hmm. uh, with these felony charges. Now, why do I mention that? I mentioned that because fast forward 2022, you have now a bill they passed this session where the GBI itself mm -hmm. can now not even have to get permission mission from the Secretary of State's office, they can go ahead and investigate yeah. claims, bogus claims and fallacious claims on their own. Mm -hmm. So just imagine if they had free will to do whatever they wanted to do, even in light of 2010 when Brian Kemp had to get the permission for them to do it, at least he had some safeguards in place. Just imagine now if anybody can just say, oh, that's voter fraud. And why is that a problem? Because the Secretary of State has a huge budget in the state, one of the largest budgets in the state outside of education and health care. Now, why is that important? Because now in the Secretary of State's website, there is an office dedicated just to stopping voter fraud. Now, why would you dedicate millions of dollars to stopping voter fraud when the secretary himself said that there was no really significant amount of voter fraud in the past election. This means that you're using the office for political expediency to speak to your base, which is dangerous. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I would do, regardless of po po you know political affiliation, I would make sure that there is integrity and honor and decency in the Secretary of State's office. Now, granted, I would love for Democrats to win every time, but be very clear, I can assure you that even Joe Biden would not call it D. Dawkins Hagler if he were running for election and did not win and wanted me to go find some votes like Trump did to Brad Raffensperger. Because it's something about a black woman when she's in office, you will not play with her like that because you understand the magnitude of what it's like to be in that situation and to have uh, to have some type of integrity and to stand up for your people at all times and all places. Now, you know what? You about to make me run through this studio because that you bring up a great point. And, and one of the things that you're saying is that you're going to stand up. You're going to advocate. And one of your biggest things that you advocate for and, you know, that you fight for in general is against human trafficking, domestic violence, and teen dating violence. You know, talk about your work there and just kind of let people know that you mean business. Yes, I do mean business because, you know, all of these issues are interconnected. When we are put in places of power or we are put in decision making places, it is incumbent upon us to do the will of the people who send us there. And many times we go along to get along. We get in positions of power and then whatever comes along, whoever says something, we'll go along with it knowing that it's not good for our people. So for me, it's important to understand that black women matter. I, Black people in general matter, but black women really matter because we saw what happened when Katanji Brown Jackson was trying to be appointed to confirm to the Supreme Court and how she was the most qualified, how she had the most education, but how they tried to play her and downgrade who she was as a person. Black women always have to show up stronger. So just imagine if you are on the marginalized side of community, of life, and you have been told because you may be, uh, don't have much education or your family may not have much wealth, and then how you find yourself in situations where you may be uh, prostituted by someone or you may uh, find yourself in a domestic violence situation and then you, who's going to speak up for you when people don't even speak up for a woman like Katanji Brown Jackson who has the most education and the most uh, uh, qualities and experience. So it, it, it's incumbent upon those of us who are standing in those places to make sure we fight against human sex trafficking because believe it or not, Black girls die too. But if, if, and so I did a documentary called Black Girls Die Too because what I was noticing is if it was a, if it was a white girl that went missing, like missing and exploited children or black children went missing, mm -hmm. the news would not cover the story mm -hmm. in the same magnitude. Mm -hmm. And so, but black girls do die too. And so we did the documentary to speak to the very situation of human trafficking and that's why it's important to be a leader, not just when it's convenient, but in those times when people don't even have voice or agency to speak for themselves. That's why we have to be the ones to do that. And so whether it's domestic violence, uh, introducing legislation for years, to introduce a curriculum in public schools that, talk, that talks about love does not hurt. Because many times people 
don't always have the right examples of what a loving relationship would look like or what a relationship looks like uh, absence of violence because they may have seen violence when they were growing up and think that this is an acceptable way to, to, to be in a relationship when it's not. And so who, so who better to speak to than a black woman who, who understands the plight of black women uh, uh, collectively and then the black issues in general. Like a lot of times, uh, I have two black sons. I'm married to a black man, and I know it scares me when they walk out the house and have to, you know, are they going to come back home because someone may profile them on the way to where they're going to be? And 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 people can't see when you're a black man whether you are uh, an educated black man or, or what they call a respectable black man. To me, any black man that's breathing is a respectable black man. And so we've got to get out of the notion that if you if you have a certain education or you live in a certain neighborhood or you drive a certain car or have a certain job, then you are respectable. No, we're all respectable. Our flesh matters. And we don't speak enough to the very issues that are salient to our community. And we allow these things. And when I say by allow, we collectively allow it to happen when we do not collectively speak out against them together. And that's why I do what I do. Right, and you're running for Georgia Secretary of State. Tell people where they can support you, how they can find you, um, because I feel like there's going to be a few people that really want to make sure during this early voting period that they cast their vote for you. Thank you so much. So they can find me on all social media handles. My website, though, is www.deeforgeorgia. So that's dforgeorgia.com. You can find me on uh, Facebook at D for Georgia, uh, D Dawkins Hagler for Georgia, uh, Instagram D Dawkins Hagler, and Twitter D Dawkins Hagler. And I'm not as good with social media as I should be, uh, <laughs> but if you go and look, you will be able to find some information on me. Or, you know, if people want to know how long has she been in the game and how long is she just talking this talk, uh, even down to this is a good example. Down to my fingernails. People say, well, what's going on with your fingernails? Are those M&M's? No, it's not M&M's colors. <laughs> it, is, it represents most of the flags of Africa and the Caribbean because I lived that experience. My nails have been like this probably for the past year. And I believe until we're all are free, no one is free. And so I'm always speaking to issues. I've spent a lot of my time doing the work that a Secretary of State would do. I travel in and out from Africa and the Caribbean fighting for people of African descent, whether they are on the continent or in the diaspora. This is one of the reasons why I just just got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. It's because I've been in these countries fighting for us to have uh, some type of equality and freedom collectively and together. And I just honestly believe that if we ever get together in one place, black people in, the, in Africa and then in, in the diaspora, on the continent and the diaspora, we'll be the force that the world has never seen. But first of all, we gotta first learn to get together.